three-day Pan-African Conference on Inequalities in the Context of Structural Transformation has ended in Accra, Ghana. In his opening address, the chairman for the session, Honorable Setekwe, expressed his concern on the alarming rates of inequality. But definitely, questions of global inequality, uh, even in the advanced countries, as we can see, have been worsened in recent times uh, by the global financial crisis that has seen the most advanced economies come to their knees and the impact that it has had. On identifying the policy actions to move forward, different speakers came up with criticisms and suggestions based on the discussions of the past days of the conference. As we approach the end of the MDGs and phase post-2015, era, we have to identify policy actions to move forward the global and Africa equitable development agenda, politically, socially, and economically. Imagine a situation where communities collateralize their land, and there is a default on loan, either to institutions and so on and so forth, and they lose this, and you project this for 25 years ahead. What are the likely implications of a situation where you actually end up in massive land dispossession? Okay? In which, in which land ownership now gets concentrated in the hands of, uh, what do you call it? What are the implications for communities where, where, where lineage ownership rather than just individual ownership and the fact that you cannot alienate land? Specifically, what does this say for Kenyan politics if you were to look at the history of land dispossession in the Kikuyu areas, for instance? Now, what I'm saying here is this. The, the, the need for us actually to be imaginative and rather than just regurgitate what, they call it, uh, what people say from outside and development strategies that speak to our own context and our own people. Thank you. This is one gender budgeting. You know, gender is cross-cutting. And if you make the effort to put local monies aside, for instance, one thousandth of the amount to spend on security could be devoted to gender mainstreaming from the policy level to the grassroots level. I think something could be achieved. On his observations, Senator Bilo Kero of Mandera County in Kenya said, political leadership is a failure and the continent can still make it. We need appropriate legal and policy uh, framework on inequalities at national and international level in all future initiatives. And let's start off with the post-2015 um, uh, development agenda, um, Africa Union 2063. Let us have, in all of those goals, we must include uh, clearly um, uh, you know, a framework on inequalities that must underpin uh, all the goals that will be, um, uh, you know, in all the dimensions that we have uh, mentioned. Second, I want to suggest also that um, a universal charter to sort of outlaw, uh, and I said in quotes, um, regulations and policies with outright inequity uh, and encourage equitable socioeconomic development programs and initiatives. We have charters on human rights. We have charters that are being enforced, um, you know, globally by all the countries that are members of the UN. Um, I, I want to suggest, let us have a framework to reject discrimination and, and, and enforce equal access to development, equal access to resources, equal access to jobs. Let us try and see why we cannot, um, in my suggestion is we, I think we can, and I think it's time we, we, we mainstream this kind of... Um, uh, a charter. The Director of Social Development Policy Division of the United Nations Economic Commission of Africa, Madame Techua Menu, spoke from the ECA perspective. According to her, it's realized that there is a slow progress in addressing inequality. She made some suggestions. The Rio um, 2012 summit reaffirmed the need for a world that is just equitable and inclusive 
and the need for all of us to work together to promote sustained and inclusive economic growth, social development and environmental protection to benefit all. And in this regard, we know that we should realize the internationally agreed development goals, including the MDGs, by promoting decent and productive employment and social protection in both formal and informal economies. The African Union 2063 vision provides an ambitious and timely context, as well as the basis for tackling the equality development agenda in Africa. And the Common Africa position on the post-2015 development agenda places a high premium on equitable development, um, which is to be anchored, among other things, on the promotion of gender equality and women's empowerment. And in terms of the position of the ECA and to some extent the UN in general, the ECA recognizes that there cannot be meaningful development in Africa without addressing the fundamental causes of inequality, such as economic and social power structures in the decision-making process. And for this reason, we are supporting the African Union Commission and the regional economic com communities in their efforts to promote equality and equity in the decision-making processes through a number of legal instruments and protocols. However, these instruments need to be translated into national policies. And ECA's objective going forward is to work closely with member states to achieve Africa's transformation agenda by supporting member states in their efforts to implement growth-oriented macroeconomic policies and to restore development planning with a view to review, uh, reducing inequality. In his speech, Mr. Nile Pierre Chief Policy Coordination Branch, Department of Economics and Social Affairs said, growing inequality is a global phenomenon. Multilateral rules themselves uh, are the basis for much of the global inequality that, that exist. Globalization has actually forced, foisted a lot of the inequalities between and among countries. Uh, the question of what is the role of markets versus the role of government it's, it's a very significant part of the discussion, and it's a causal factor of much of the inequality. The role of government, and linked to the structural adjustment, the history of structural adjustment programs, in many countries, but particularly in Africa, has been diminished, if not demolished in many cases. And so, the effect of that, we were told then that the, the markets should prevail and markets will fix things. Uh, inadequate attention to fairness and rights-based approach in, in the international discourse that has taken place over the last decades. Um, now, how do we then su sustain our development gains where those have happened under the MDGs and the internationally agreed development framework? Um, we're advocating that there is a need to build strong institutions. We have to get back to the basics. Strong institutions are where the implementation of development programs and the achievement of development objectives will begin. We're also saying that we need to institutionalize successful practices. We need to identify what those successes are and know what caused them, what are their main features, and then institutionalize them so that they're not just a flash in the pan experience, but something that's sustained uh, despite who's in government or what are the larger issues a society has to tackle with. To share ideas, make suggestions on different topical issues, parallel sessions were again created on policies and strategies for an equitable, balanced transformation agenda. What we do is really um, focus on issues of planning, how to support countries, strengthen their planning capacities. And in this context of structural transformation, really how can planning, uh, how can structural transformation be folded into the planning process to make it more effective? So what kind of policies are we looking at when we talk about structural transformation? And how, what kind of policies can lead to inclusive, people-centered, and sustained, sustainable development? One, we need to enhance productive capacities, promote trade, investment, and industrialization at national level. 
and we need to promote the linkages between these sectors. But we need appropriate policies, and that's the most critical part of it. We need supporting policies at national level, at regional level, and also at global level. And that's the nature of globalization of policy making. I see three uh, major challenges uh, for, for us uh, in, the near, in the near term. The first challenge would be the, the challenge of creating and expanding decent employment. There's a huge unemployment. The only way in which we are going to be able to, to reduce poverty, to overcome hunger, food insecurity, etc., is by increasing employment. The options obviously differ from, from situation to situation, and I don't have any uh, universal uh, template to offer. Uh, I would suggest that a very pragmatic approach is to pursue what I suggested on Monday as developmental governance. What does developmental governance mean? It basically means to identify what are the major bottlenecks. If the major bottleneck is the availability of finance or credit, that then one tries to understand why uh, credit is not available. If the major bottleneck are uh, trade constraints, as Jane, for example, was, was talking about, then one tries to overcome those trade constraints. The question principal has been posed in the cadre of this section parallel. I will repeat. The first question is the following. How do we ensure a transformation structural des économies africaines favorisant l'inclusion et la cohésion sociale et garantissant le développement économique et social pour tous. Deuxième question, quels devraient être les rôles de l'État et du secteur privé Pour répondre à cette question, je vous propose la démarche suivante. Dans un premier temps, Nous allons rappeler les options de politique économique que le mouvement syndical africain propose. Dans un second temps, nous allons relever les responsabilités qui doivent incomber à toutes les parties prenantes, à savoir l'État, le secteur privé et les acteurs sociaux. Quelles sont les options de politique économique que la Confédération syndicale internationale peut proposer à l'Afrique Nous avons suivi les deux jours de débat. Nous avons aussi mené des analyses sur l'économie africaine. Les syndicats africains ont identifié deux problèmes majeurs sur le plan économique pour l'Afrique. Le premier problème, c'est la faiblesse de l'agriculture. Or, l'Afrique, la plupart du temps, est caractérisée par la prédominance de l'agriculture. Le second problème que nous avons identifié, qui a été corroboré par l'intervention du BIT hier, c'est qu'en Afrique, il existe beaucoup d'emplois, puisque le taux de chômage moyen ces dernières années est de l'ordre de 7% à 8% selon les pays. Certes, le chômage des jeunes est en général deux fois ce niveau. Mais qu'est-ce qu'on constate La plupart des emplois en Afrique sont des emplois précaires et que l'on retrouve dans l'économie informelle. We want to leave this conference with a set of ideas that we can push forward for the post 2015 development agenda. So we cannot go there with just the challenges, but we need to talk about what our priorities and how we're going to move forward. The world has changed. The world is changing. And there's a fundamental discussion that we as Africans need to have, but I think we are afraid to have it. It's the issue of how do we restructure our governance architecture to respond to the needs that we're facing today. Not pre-colonial times, not post-colonial times, but today. The biggest challenge we face in Sub-Saharan Africa is that the numbers do not exist in many cases on a regular basis. So if you do not have the numbers, then it becomes extremely difficult to work out what is indeed the unemployment rate, what is the uh, employment rate, what is working poverty and so on. So for a lot of them are guesstimates. I love it when we say we speak with one voice. 
and forget that we act in discord. And I think that's one thing which we need to look at. We speak with one voice, but we need to change the way we act. And then secondly, perhaps uh, Jane, Jomo, and Kuglo, all of you will agree that structural transformation, especially when you look at the way Africa is approaching negotiations to free trade areas, we're basically junior partners of imperialism because the global division of labor locates us on the lower value chain. And I think it's something that we might want to look at and say, the thinking is that we need to integrate with the rest of the globe, but we are wrongly integrated. Because as long as the global value chain locates us on the lower echelons, we will not do anything that will make us move. Going around the world and talking to leaders and to people about and asking the question, what is the key to growth? What is the key to equitable growth? They say infrastructure is the key. And in my work on the program for infrastructure development in Africa, we are in favor of integration within the African continent. We're not in favor of integration where Africa gets to more efficiently cheap ship, export all of its raw materials to the rest of the world for lower and lower prices. And so what kind of infrastructure is going to create integration within Africa so that people can get to jobs? People can get from rural locations to jobs, to schools, so that the cost to transport goods and services, agriculture from northern Ghana to southern Ghana is cheaper than transporting them to southern Ghana from the United States or for Europe. So we all need to be in favor of infrastructure. But the question is, what kind and what kind of integration will it foster? It is important that there is a focus on education in this early stages in, the people's, uh, in, in people's lives. Because there is a, a lot of information that we have now which suggests that there is a, the, the absorption capacity in those levels when children are young is very high, but also it enables the children to make the kind, as adults, to make the kind of choices that they would not otherwise have been able to make because at that level they are given a lot more information which makes them to be able to choose the direction in life that they want to take. The importance of information, the issue of ideas, and also the, the question of power, this whole discussion about, about, about social agency, and also some of the points that came in uh, about the state. I think there are some various issues too about accountability uh, and, and, and process, but also uh, the question of the role of the state the character of the state, and also the kind of policy choices which are necessary, not simply sectorally, but in a very fundamental way, which shapes the context within which uh, inequalities, the, 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 the policies that themselves reproduce uh, inequality as, as, as an inbuilt characteristic, you know, about, about social development and, and the growth model. Uh, I thank you all very much for your participation.